Shalom, shalom. <clears throat> Devon Mays here. Um, today we're going to be talking about missions. Um, everybody has a specific mission or a job to do in this world. <clears throat> Some people are here to teach. Some people are here to teach many different things. We have people skilled in so many different things in life. We have carpenters and people who <clears throat> can build houses and uh, people who teach finance, banking, um, you know, people who make cars, you know, so many different um, things, electricians, plumbers, you know, people who produce food. So, you know, the question is, what is your mission? We all have a mission in life. And uh, I'm going to go through a couple of examples just to show, you know, um, what purpose that certain people serve in the world that affects us today. And then maybe it can help you figure out your purpose or your specific mission. So let's get into this. Uh, <clears throat> the duty of all mankind. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. Fear God for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing. So the true, true, true purpose of life is to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, that concept of fear is more of a concept of respect, but also the word <clears throat> fear, when you break it down, if you go to Job 28, 28, it talks about the fear of God is wisdom because wisdom can keep you safe. You know, if you get close to a, a cliff, it's wise to back up off of that cliff, right? That's wisdom. But that fear is showing your is what is what uh ignites your wisdom. When something scares you, it makes you think, right? So Exodus 18 and 20, teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. So <clears throat> I think everybody can relate to this. Um, as parents, as teachers, as men and women. We have uh, the ability and the responsibility to teach people around us instructions and in how they are to live and how they are to behave. I mean, you can't run a functional society if you don't have rules. Everybody obeys traffic laws, right? Because if you didn't, you'd have a very dangerous uh, roadway. It's as dangerous as it is, but without those traffic laws, mm, I don't know if we could... Um, Function in, uh, on, the, on these roads. Micah 4 and 2. Many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his way so that we will <clears throat> that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So in the future, everybody will get a chance to go and learn Torah in Israel. And... Um, you know, we will be, have the responsibility of learning and also the responsibility of uh, keeping those commandments, which is how we are to behave. As a, as a, as all the nations of the world will, you know, will come to, you know, learn peace and um, get along and um, have a better world that everybody wishes for. Right. The, the, the utopia that everybody talks about. Is it possible? Yes. So Israel as a nation has a purpose. Exodus 19 and 6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So um, there's many nations. Now Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This just means that they're set apart because as priests they would be teachers. So just like if you have a company, you should have a, you know, it's not saying you should, but most companies have a CEO, they have managers or supervisors. Israel's job description is to be like the managers or the CEOs or of the of this of this earth teaching the commandments of God. Now, given their history, they did not fulfill this to their full potential. 
there was times that they, you know, reached a height, like in the time of uh, David and Solomon. But of course, we know they were also punished um, for forsaking God and his commandments and the privilege that he gave them to be this kingdom of priests. Um, Deuteronomy 24 and 8, take heed in an outbreak of leprosy that you, you uh, carefully observe and do according to all that the priest, the Levite, shall teach you, just, I com just as I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do. Now, within Israel, within this kingdom of priests, you really have Levitical priests, and the Levites are specifically the main teachers of Israel. So all of Israel were considered the kingdom of priests, but all Israelites are not from the tribe of Levi, which are the specific priests who have specific duties within Israel. For example, in Ezekiel 44, 21 and 23, no priest shall drink wine when he encounters the inner court. They shall not take a, a, as wife a widow or divorced woman, but take versions of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of priests. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. So even within Israel, you had the priests that taught the nation the difference between the holy and the non unholy and between the clean and the unclean. Now, this is not to say that other nations did not possess wisdom and skills and abilities because we read in the book of Kings, um, Solomon was compared to the other wise men of the East. And he gave names. Read 1 Kings chapter 4, when all the kings of the earth came to Solomon. Um, within those people, within those kings, and when you read the book of Kings, within those kings that came to visit Solomon, they it, it names other people that Solomon was compared to in his wisdom. And there was many, many, many people in the East that were considered very, very wise. Uh, the king of Tyre was considered very, very wise. So, um, this is by no means saying that only Israel can teach the world anything, but Israel was given the Torah for a specific reason. So this is where we find prophecies and um, many, many secrets of the world. And like I said, this is not to say that other nations do not possess wisdom and insight and secrets of the world, but um, just as speaking from a Torah's perspective, that Israel is... Um, is designated as a kingdom of priests to teach. So this was their mission. Okay. So the topic of this, this lecture is mission. So Israel was given a mission and that mission is to teach the world. And as a, as these teachers, you know, the concept of being a light to the Gentiles and uh, <clears throat> within Israel, they also had their own teachers to teach that nation how to be the light to the nations. So, we know one of the first people that um, is highlighted with a very, very, very serious mission is Noah. As we read in Genesis 5, 28, 29, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So Noah is known for building the ark. But this specific thing that Lamech is talked about is talking about is not often discussed. Now what is this, what exactly is he talking about? This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands. What does this have to do with the flood? Well, specifically, this is not really talking about the flood. So we're going to go into the oral Torah. So for those who have a problem or are just not familiar with the oral Torah, I have a lecture called Why Do Jews and Christians Reject the Oral Tradition? And, you know, I go into a lot more detail there, but we see here in, um, on myjewishlearning.com, there's an article that says, a midrash which appears in Yakut Ruvini and is quoted by Rabbi uh, Hasid mid-13th century adds a fascinating element to the naming of Noah, according to the Midrash. And Midrash is a Hebrew term, which is found in actual Tanakh. And I, I show all this in um, my lecture, uh, Why Do Jews and um, Christians Reject the Oral Tradition? Noah was the first human being born with an opposable thumb. 
Until his birth, mankind had not evolved sufficiently to make, hold, and use tools, and instead dug the earth with their paw-like hands. With a human hand, with proper fingers and an opposable thumb, mankind evolved into tool makers and users. This midrash obviously takes Lemek's words, the sorrow of our hands, quite literally, and complements the tradition which sees Noah as the inventor of farming implements. A lot of people are not familiar with this. So this is Noah's mission. He was born with the basically with five fingers with an opposable thumb. So the concept of people, you know, had a, like a paw, you know, like a the Lego hand, right? It's kind of like one kind of like, you know, I don't even know how it was shaped, but his, his thumb didn't come out, the opposable thumb, right? This kind of gives us a lot more movement with our fingers to grasp and do a lot of different things, you know, when everything is kind of together. So um, this was Noah's mission because he was able to build that ark. You know, if you want to take that in consideration, because he was able to use more of his hand. He had more, you know, use of usage of his of his, his limbs and <clears throat> which would make building the ark a lot more easier, right? Makes a lot of sense. So that's just speaking about Noah. So just to back up the concept of a midrash before you think it's uh something that the rabbis made up. <clears throat> Some translations say midrash, some translations say annals, some translations, you know, different terminology. Um, Second Chronicles 13, 22. Now the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways and his sayings are written in the annals of the prophet Edo. But in the International Standard Version, it says the rest of Abijah, Abijah's accomplishments, his lifestyle and his memoirs are recorded in the midrash of the prophet Edo. So where is this midrash? So this is the Tanakh giving you another source that's not in the Tanakh. That will be considered the oral tradition. And um, you can argue about where this Midrash is and how to get to it, but we see in the Tanakh, it mentions another source of information. New American Bible. The rest of the Acts of Abijah, his deeds and his words are recorded in the Midrash of the prophet Edo. So not only the International Standard Version, but also the New American Bible used the word Midrash, which means in the annals. 47, 4097 in the Strong's Concordance. So <clears throat> Jeremiah's mission. Jeremiah was a prophet. And um, there's some people who think Jeremiah was more of a prophet of doom because he spoke a lot of prophecies that would cause doom to a lot of nations, <clears throat> a lot of nations in his generation. Now he did, uh, uh, you know, try to uplift people and, and tell them to, you know, get their act together. But he lived in a generation where Nebuchadnezzar took over and that was kind of like the punishment of the world <laughs> to send Nebuchadnezzar to have authority over them. So this is one of the reasons he's called the prophet of doom. But it says in Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, oh Lord, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. So we see Jeremiah, before he was even born, he was chosen to be a prophet to the nations. And he says, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. For you should go to all to whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. So you can come with a mission at any age. And if God wants you to fulfill this mission, he knows how old you're going to be. You just need to do what he told you to do. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. See, <clears throat> I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. So he wasn't only a prophet of doom. 
He also was a prophet telling you about the future, but he also uh, is known very much for telling people that their demise was coming. But this was his mission. And God says, they're not going to like what you have to say, but I'm going to deliver you from these people. I mean, Jeremiah is a pretty thick book. It's over 50 chapters. So we see uh, a lot of people in the world named Jeremiah and uh, he had a mission and um, he was given it as a youth. And God said, doesn't, it doesn't matter how old you are, whatever I command you, you shall speak. So this was Jeremiah's mission. Now, God doesn't come and directly talk to us like that anymore. You know, we don't have prophets like that, but your mission can be just as important. You know, you, you know, you never know who's here to change the world or sway the world in, in, in different ways. So um, pay attention to your gifts and your talents and your education. Why did you learn this? Why do you are you drawn to the, this specific type of education? You know, people call it your calling or something like that. But just, you know, be aware that you have. Uh, everybody's skill is for something. There is no coincidences. David, King David, very, very known figure. Is the model Messiah. So what does that mean? Um. David himself really wasn't sure what that meant. In 2 Samuel 7, 18, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, who am I, O Lord? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? So even David was wondering, what, what is my purpose? Like, why, why me? What is my house? What is my family that you have brought me this far and gave me this kingdom and these privileges? Psalm 78, 70, he also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. David was just a herder. And now all of a sudden he's king. So he himself was very humble and not aware that he had this mission in front of him. So he asked, what is my house? What, what is going on here? And we see again, Psalm 89, 20, I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. So here we see the word anointed. We see I have made David a Messiah. And David's name carried a lot of merit. Isaiah 37, 35, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So even though David was long dead, we see the prophet Isaiah telling us that the city was going to be destroyed. But God says, you know what? For David's sake and my sake, I'm going to defend this city. So David carried a lot of weight. And why am I calling him the model Messiah? When we read about the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah specifically after, they're always compared to David. 2 Kings 16.2. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God as his father David had done. So we basically see that he was wicked, right? He did not do what was right in the sight of God as David had done. So he's compared to David. Second Kings 18, 1 through 3. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. So here we see the son of this wicked king, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. So here we see a righteous king compared to David. So the wicked and the righteous kings are compared to David because David was the model Messiah. Ezekiel 37 and 25. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Now, this is just talking about the house of David, not specifically David as a person, but the, the tribal lineage of David, David from the house of Judah, will be the kings of Israel forever. So David's mission was to come be the model Messiah. He's got a lot of privileges and a lot of it talks about the mercy of that he gave David and um, all the kings are compared to him. Even the future kings are called 
the house of David or called to be named from the house of David, should I say. Jonah's mission. Now, Jonah tried to avoid his mission. It says in Jonah 1, 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, you know, he was told to go to Nineveh. But he tried to run away. He got on a boat, caused the boat to have problems. A storm came, and they ended up throwing him overboard. You know, it's a whole story. But his mission was to go to Nineveh, and he didn't want to do it. Now, um, there's a couple of different commentaries on why he didn't want to do it, because if he was going to go and tell the Gentiles to repent, had they listened, it's going to be an embarrassment for Israel who had a prophet and they didn't listen. Like, how does that look that me as a prophet telling my own people, Israel to repent, they don't listen to God, but they hear I'm a prophet of Israel, go tell these Gentiles to repent and they listen. That makes us look bad. But when he didn't listen, Jonah three and one says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. So when God tell you to do something, you're going to do it. Now he had, you know, this also tells us about freedom of choice because he had the choice to not to do it. That's why he tried to avoid it. And God came to him again. He was like, okay, let me go ahead and get this done because obviously God wants me to do something, but he had a free choice. Obviously, or the first time he wouldn't have been able to, you know, he ran off. So he, he had a choice to do that. But his mission was to go to Nineveh and he eventually went to Nineveh. And this is what he said. Jonah 3, 1 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So he tried to avoid it, but eventually he ended up doing his job or his mission. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh should be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word of the Lord came to, to the king. Then, then, the, then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let them, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will, will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So Jonah's mission was to give a warning to this nation, this great city called Nineveh, to repent or God was going to destroy it. So the first thing we see in verse 5 is the people believed God. They believed it. They had faith, but that's that's not that wasn't enough. Then they proclaimed a fast. We know fasting on Yom Kippur gets Israel forgiven once a year. So they believed God. Then they fasted. Then it says, uh, let us turn from our evil way in verse 8. They cried mightily the first. Well, it says, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. So they humbled themselves to put on sackcloth. Then they cried to God, right? Show some tears. And then it says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence in his hands. So they did a lot of different steps. Then it says, God saw their works. It doesn't say, and then he saw that they believe. First, they believed, and then they did some work. They believed God. They put on sackcloth. They cried, and then they repented. They turned from the evil way and the evil and the violence that was in their hands. And God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So Jonah was successful in his mission by getting these people to repent. He basically was a savior. He told the people to repent, and they did, and they got saved. So Jonah's mission was a savior. 
He didn't have to go and die. He didn't have to shed any blood. He didn't go and make disciples. He showed up, told them what was going to happen. They, they listened. They believed. They put on sackcloth. They fasted, and they repented. And God saw their works. Why? Because Jonah fulfilled his mission. Took a little convincing, but he got it done. So <clears throat> whatever your mission is, you know, work at it. Be good at it. Everybody's different. Everybody can't be a psychologist. Everybody can't be a doctor. Everybody can't be a blacksmith, you know, um, a welder or a even a bus driver, everybody has a different job to do. The skilled will serve kings. Proverbs 22 and 29. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. So if you're very good at what you do, you're going to be put in a very high position. Some people have to, you know, uh, be in charge of the money system. You know, Somebody's got to be that person to raise or lower interest rates, which affects everybody. Somebody's got to be a military commander. Like there's there's so many different jobs in the world. Daniel 1 and, 1 and 19, the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. So we see the talent of these people. They served kings because he found none equal to them. So that was their mission. We know Daniel famously has his own book in the Tanakh, and Daniel served the king with his skills that he had, and that was Daniel's mission, who interpreted these dreams that are, have been talked about for the last 2,000 years, or and longer. So, you know, we all have a different mission. And Daniel also was a savior because his interpretation of that dream saved all the wise men that Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill. So we have another situation where somebody fulfilled their mission and saved a bunch of people like Jonah. And we see same thing with Daniel. But Noah, Noah saved his family because, you know, he came, he showed up, fulfilled his mission, built the ark, got the covenant. Saved a bunch of people, and here we are today. So what is your mission? Joshua 22 and 3. For a long time now to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. So specifically, you know, in the book of Joshua, he's talking to the Jews or the Israelites, but it says you have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. He did his job. What's your job? Have you carried out your mission? It might not be specifically given to you by God, like it was to Joshua with the communication tip, but you being born at a specific place and at a specific time, this was your mission. Isaiah 48, 15. I, even I have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I will bring him and he will succeed in his mission. What is your mission that you need to succeed in? Proverbs 24, 16. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. You might fail in your mission at first, but you need to be able to get up. You definitely should be able to get up from your mission. If you fall, get up. It might take you 20 years to fulfill your mission. But get up. Some missions have to be passed down. You might not fulfill the mission of something. You might have started to build a school and died in the process and you passed it down to your son. You might have built any type of organization, a community service, something, and your children are the ones who bring it to fruition. But start it. You might all be part of a mission. So I just wanted to share that. Um, 
I hope this helps. Um, subscribe to uh, Clouds of Torah, my YouTube page. Hit the like button, and um, we will see you next time. Shalom.